Summer Olympics, USSA's Senior Nationals, and World Masters Championships will be hosted here. And then he makes the connection to infrastructure. Development of infrastructure is a declaration that this state is a destination for fitness and athletic excellence. And here is his view of Minnesota. Why not offer this to the world to entice the world's best to come here? The most talented and gifted athletes, best and brightest businesses, most innovative and emerging industries, because we offer the best city, the best state. Think of the different view of what one infrastructure investment means to attract people from all over the world because of what happens here. And it is a message to the whole world about what we are and how we view ourselves. I think to start our discussion tonight, to know there's one citizen who understands that one line in the bill. I won't repeat any of the other points I've made about this bill. You've heard them all here on the House floor. Only a reminder that this is one example of many. I told the story of the Winona ports. I told the story of the Thief River Falls Airport, and we could go on and on. Every line that in some way connects this bill to the economy of the state of Minnesota. The state government puts in place infrastructure that allows us to prosper, that allows business and industry to come here and to prosper. And members, rather than the negative, Rather than beginning with the negative, I choose to put the bill in this context of this visionary Minnesota citizen who sees the importance of one line in this bill. Members, I will just speak very briefly. Um, we have a responsible and focused bill, responsible because it comes in well under our debt service guidelines. And we have been reminded just recently again that this state has done one thing well. It has managed its debt level better than most states. Minnesota's debt levels have historically been a neutral to positive part of the state's credit profile. We rank well. It is responsible and it is focused as always on those priorities that get us ready for when the economy recovers. Higher education, the biggest part of the bill, training the workforce of the future. Conservation, environment, clean water, flood mitigation, all of those pieces uh, that make us a healthy state. And finally, transportation. I'll just point out a few differences. Uh, this bill has more for the University of Minnesota uh, than it, when it left here. Uh, most of the bill is really relatively similar. It has uh, differences in amounts. I will tell you that the public was engaged in this discussion and the conference committee even yesterday in the, uh, in the evening that you heard described slightly differently. The public was here. The public was here and interested. I point out one small town, Chatfield was here. They approached me after the passage of the bill. People all over the state of Minnesota were interested in what was happening here yesterday. The um, one issue that I want to talk about a little bit because we added it in the House floor and added a couple of amendments, and that is the, the Moose Lake Sex Offender Treatment Program. We brought the entire proposal of the governor to the conference committee. We probably spent more time on that issue than any other in the conference committee. In our meeting, we had Dennis Benson. Uh, he presented at some length and responded to a number of questions. We struggled with the issue, can we break this apart? Can it be phased in some way? 
you may recall some of the debate on the house floor led to an amendment that was added by representative ward studying existing facilities representative pay mar drafted a refined version and added a component of that that i think was triggered by some of the debate on the house floor and the representative pay mars amendment is in the bill he asks for three commissioners corrections d h s and public safety to come together to look at the broad range of issues certainly one of those is the space there and space around the state but the other is that emerging policy discussion that's happening around this issue and those three commissioners are to take a look at that broad set of, of uh, questions and come to us with a recommendation for possible legislative action that uh, issue is um, comes to you in that form uh, members i think it is um, not unlike uh, what you um, had on the floor and so i won't go into much detail beyond that and i would encourage your support the member from cast representative howes thank you madam speaker uh, before i do anything i'd like to thank representative Halsman for her hard work jenny and and the rest of your staff all the members on the committee it was a difficult time difficult choices uh, Representative Hausman, you did a fine job. You, you did what you were told, and you did a good job. Is the bill too high? In my personal opinion, I think it is. I, I spent my whole life in the construction industry. I do believe we need something like this. Maybe it's too high, but I'm not going to debate that on the House floor. That's for committee work. That's where we roll up our sleeves and do it. I did sign the conference committee report. Madam Speaker, thank you for putting me on the committee. I'm sorry that I took ill and couldn't make it on Sunday. Um, I'll be there next time if there isn't. I hope there's a next time. But again, and, and Madam Speaker, uh, just a point I'd like to make to the body, because it does offend me. If someone brings up and calls it, again, the debt bill, that's an embarrassment to the uh, chairman of the committee. It's an embarrassment to me. It's a capital investment committee. Save that for the brochures. And also, if, uh, if, if someone brings up, again, Washington-style politics, the only similarities between that is Walker starts with a W, Washington starts with a W. It ends there. I am not a Washington politician. The member from Hennepin, Representative Zellers. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I move that uh, the House refuse to adopt the conference committee report on House File 2700. The bill will be returned to conference committee, and I respectfully request a roll call. Representative Zellers requests a roll call on the motion to refuse to adopt. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call on the motion to refuse to adopt. To your motion, Representative Zellers. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. And, uh, you know, we've, we've had this discussion now, and uh, maybe there's some differences in opinion on when the discussion took place, how the discussion took place. But make no mistake about, as Representative Coles pointed out, uh, when the vote took place. And although maybe the folks from Chatfield were uh, in the room earlier in the evening, uh, when the vote took place, Madam Speaker and members, it was well beyond what any normal taxpayer in Minnesota would consider normal business hours. Uh, as the governor has said, uh, I think qu quite honestly, was very gracious about it at the beginning. Some of you may disagree, but he asked for consideration on the bill as to what the size would be and the projects would be. Gently reminded uh, after we got into session, said maybe we're getting a little too far north. I did appreciate Representative Hausman saying that you wanted to try to stay below a billion dollar bill, uh, but then once we got down here, session started, we're north of a billion dollars. And Madam Speaker and members, the governor sent out a letter, something uh, I guess not traditional down here, but as a way, and, and the reason I make this motion is so that we do have the opportunity to go back, and we do have the opportunity to fully negotiate this in the light of day, during the daylight, when members of both the public and our members can have a chance to have a say in the bill. 2, 3 o'clock in the morning on a Sunday night does not give the, the general public an opportunity to come down and comment. And to be doing this the second or third week of February in the dark of night is also what I would consider not respectful to the people's work. Madam Speaker, members, I, I think the most important line from the governor's letter is that the people of Minnesota expect their tax dollars to be spent frugally and wisely. North of a billion dollars or the sham wow price of $9.99 being just a little bit under, is doing a disservice to that frugality that the state of Minnesota is not only known for, but also prides itself on. We're spending our money wisely. This does not do that. 
This is misplaced priorities besides the fact that we've yet to see from the majority how we're going to balance the $1.2 billion budget deficit. We're going to spend just about a billion dollars early on in the session. Madam Speaker, members, I, I think we should go back to conference committee. This isn't, as the governor says in his, uh, his letter, this is the reset button. This is the chance to go back now before it gets to a veto, start over, renegotiate some of these things that are priorities. Again, some of the sex offender prison language, some of the things that are core to public safety, get those in there, get that passed, leave some of the other things behind. Representative Howes, I won't say Washington-style politics, but some of the projects uh, look awfully familiar like goodies for home. Madam Speaker, members, I ask that you uh, refuse to adopt the report, send it back to conference committee, do the work that we need to do in the daylight so the voters of the state, the taxpayers of the state, the people actually paying the bill can see the work being done before their eyes, not at night on their, home uh, on their computers at home. On the motion to refuse to adopt, Representative Biskins. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I stand in support of the motion to refuse to adopt. You know, we have in front of us a Washington-style debt bill that was brought to us uh, by a committee uh, in the middle of the night adds on um, a huge amount of extra debt on the back of our, our taxpayers in a time where they simply cannot sustain it. Members, even, even the Star Tribune refers to this as a borrowing bill. They did just this Saturday. Now, one of the things that I found interesting is that um, in uh, the member from St. Paul, the chair of the committee's uh, presentation was the words, we've managed our debt load. Members, nothing is further from the truth. See, for 30 years, we had a guideline on our debt load which talked about our debt service could be no more than 3% of our general revenue. No more than 3%. And so in politics as usual, which is too bad and is going to change come this November, with politics as usual, we call managing our debt load changing the numbers. And so we create a new guideline where we are not at 3%, we're at 3.1, 3.2, 3.5%, in the out years. And these tenths of a percent are tens of millions of dollars in new debt that we are putting on the back of our children and grandchildren. Members, if we want to spend, 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 then we should stand the post and do it with our money now and not do it to our children and our grandchildren somewhere down the road. That's not appropriate. That's not right. It's not responsible. And it definitely is not managing our debt load. We are on the motion to refuse to adopt the author of the bill, Representative Hausman. Yes, Madam Speaker, I'd like to stand in opposition to the motion. Uh, members, um, I think exaggeration isn't helpful, and we're already now talking about the two or three in the morning. I know I was uh, in bed by uh, two or three in the morning. Um, I don't know about anybody else, but uh, we had long since completed our work and were sound asleep. So exaggeration isn't helpful. And lest anyone not understand, the debt service guidelines that I referenced are the governor's debt service guidelines. The governor's debt service guidelines. We are well under them. So if, uh, if there is perhaps a hint uh, that they were something that I created uh, to stretch the level of debt, I wanted to correct that uh, perception. Uh, so I stand in opposition to the motion. We're on the motion to refuse to adopt the report. Representative Abler. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker and members. I woke up this morning with the privilege of saying hi to my new grandson in uh, Denver. So I was gone this morning, afternoon on the, from the floor here. And I was listening with some eagerness about the progress of this bill as I would, you know, I didn't have to wake up with him, which is the best thing about being a grandpa. Yeah. Somebody else wakes up and we get to enjoy him. And that's pretty cool. Um, I'm still dressed casually from my flight, but I, I'm glad I got back to talk about this. And I... Um, what I want to say, I hope, is constructive and polite to both sides. Um, the, uh, you know, we don't lack for 
points made on either side and you know who can make the better point and some of us are pretty good at it and uh, I actually try to come here to keep everybody working on the work to be done. I've had the privilege of training over half of you at the work sessions and our freshman orientation and I, I found it to be quite productive. Um, and I have never really been in charge of much, Madam Chair, so I've always had to be aware of who has more uh, more uh, power than I do about stuff. And so I just want to remind everybody that there's three bodies here. And no nothing is served um, if we just go blindly into a veto. And um, I'm not the governor. And uh, n nobody in this room is either. And um, the reason I'm speaking at this point of the motion is that we don't have to do this tonight. Um, and I, I think there's some merit in producing some of these projects. I think it's a good time to borrow some of the money. I think we want to be frugal and wise. And I, and uh, Chair Hausman, I think, has been very careful about listening to people and choosing her priorities. And I have great respect for her. And um, and I, I, I don't know why the process didn't allow for us to throw something in for the sex offender treatment facility in Moose Lake. Um, you know, $89 million is a lot, but you know, maybe 61 came up in the conference time. How about 45? A number to show that, that we're going to be working together with the person that actually has that pen. And he got elected just like the rest of us did, Madam Speaker, and, and members. And I, um, and we have, that's what elections mean, is that, that that's the process, whether you like it or not. And I, and I'm, I'm nervous about this session. I, was nervous at the end of last session when we did all of our whatever it was we did at the end when it just kind of all didn't go real well. Is it, did I say that nice? Um, and and so I don't want that to happen this time. And last week uh, we we did a bill on general assistance medical care, which I thought was going to go to conference, and it got rushed off to the governor, who I thought he was a little warmer than that, but I didn't know it was going to go right to the governor. I thought it would go to conference. The piece I had in there was a placeholder for conference, Madam Speaker, and, and I had talked to the department. They were going to work with me and the, who was ever the conferee. And, and so um, I just want to offer a, a picture, Madam Speaker, and then the body will decide how it's going to vote on this. I'm a big James Bond fan. If there's a new one coming out, I like to watch James Bond, and even when they're hokey with all those little gimmicks. But invariably in the, in the James Bond thing, there's a, a plane crashing, and James I don't, maybe that's why I like it so well. But anyway, so James is, uh, I got a personal connection. But James is fighting for the controls with the villain of the day. And so they're about to run into a mountain. And only the best pilot can steer it out of that little dive. But they're still fighting over the controls. And somehow it works out. And Madam Speaker, I'm the optimist. And I know myself, a lot of people on both sides of the aisle want to work things out to get this done at the end because we are facing the biggest challenge the state's faced in my lifetime, and, uh, and even in longer than that. And so um, those people who wanted to work together on stuff and to figure things out and to be bipartisan and to solve problems, this is a good time. We don't have to have this thing get vetoed. I'd say just send it back, and uh, you will or you won't. I don't know, I haven't talked to you, Madam Chair, but I, I think you should, and, and throw in a little bit of money for the sex offender thing, because you know it's so important. I think it's an important project anyway. But that'll move us toward resolution, Madam Speaker, and that's my thoughts, and thanks for allowing me to share. On the motion to refuse to adopt, Representative Howes. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Abler, when you become my age, uh, with Sean Connery no longer James Bond, there is no James Bond. Madam Speaker, uh, Representative Hausman and, and members, I would support uh, Representative Hausman's words that we, uh, we do adopt, so I would vote no on this motion. A, a line has been drawn in the sand by both parties. It's time to move on for another day and get our work done. Enough political rhetoric. The member from Hennepin, Representative Anderson, on the motion to refuse to adopt. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Members, I would like to say that given we are in the third week of the legislative session, that tonight we were discussing how we're going to balance the budget. We have a $1.2 billion budget deficit. And yet, what we're doing tonight is we're talking about spending more money and committing the state to more debt. Talk about having your priorities screwed up. I know when we first learned of the magnitude of the budget deficit back in December, there was a lot of talk of we're going to get right on that, we're, we're meeting in January, we're meeting in December, we're going to address this right away. And yet here we are, three weeks into session, and we're talking about spending more money 
while our schools are stressed out and not knowing what their budget is going to look like, while our roads are suffering, while the citizens of this state are worried. We are giving them no confidence in what we can do for this state because we have our priorities screwed up. We shouldn't be here tonight talking about committing the state to a billion dollars in debt. Instead, we should be talking about how we're going to turn this state around and get ourselves back on track. How we're going to generate real jobs for the Minnesotans of the state. Jobs that are going to last more than six months. This is a travesty. We owe it to the citizens of the state to get off our butts and start doing the work they called us to do, and that is to balance this budget, not spend more money and commit ourselves to even more and more debt. Please, members, support this motion. The member from Hennepin, Representative Downey, on the motion to refuse to adopt. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Members, I rise to uh, uh, support the motion um, in large part because this body adopted an amendment that I offered, uh, which uh, passed with a friendly amendment, um, so it was uh, quite bipartisan, that uh, pointed out the importance of maintaining some connection with historical debt service levels in Minnesota. And while the administration has, in fact, promulgated new debt service guidelines that make them more consistent with the bond houses, uh, a way to kind of make Minnesota's uh, debt service guidelines consistent with the rest of the country. Members, it's really important that we keep track of that guideline. Uh, Chair Hausman mentioned in uh, the proceedings here a couple days ago when we first heard the bill that Minnesota has done a really great job and that we're ranked quite highly in terms of our, our debt burden here in Minnesota. And what gave us that, part of what gave us that, was that we kept track of that debt service guideline of 3% of our general fund uh, going to debt service. And now we're well over that, 3-2, 3-4, whatever it's going to be after this bill passes. And, and my amendment wasn't to put a hard ceiling of 3% onto our, our debt service, but the amendment was simply to keep track of it. And that amendment has been yanked out in conference, and I don't know whether our conferees actually worked hard to defend that or not, or if it was easily jettisoned, but members were going to lose that connection to what has served us so well in the past. And I think it's irresponsible not to keep track of what that debt service guideline is today in comparison to the past. It served us well. It should be back in there. I uh, support the motion uh, to refuse to adopt and hope that we could go back to conference and at least put that back in. Thank you. On the motion to refuse to adopt, Representative Sertich. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Uh, members, the vote you're going to be taking this evening is whether or not we're going to create jobs today, at least 21,000 jobs in the state of Minnesota. And I refuse to hear the criticism that they're part-time jobs. That is an insult to every working man and woman who works for a contract, who works and gets their hands dirty in the construction industry, even in Representative Emmer's profession of lawyers. Those are all temporary jobs, too, or at least we hope so. Members, it's interesting that folks throw around this 3 percent limit like it was written on a tablet and brought down from, Mo from Moses from a mountain. This 3 percent guideline was developed by Governor Rudy Perpich back in the 80s when he went and talked to a banker out in New York and said, what, what kind of uh, guideline should we have in the 1980s? He asked one person, and this one person said 3 percent, and now this is the law of the land. And Representative Houseman does a good job of explaining there are other debt guidelines and that this falls way below that. But all of that is nonsense to the Minnesotans that are unemployed today. What really matters to them, are we doing something to posi positively impact our economy? Are we doing something to create jobs? This bill tonight will create over 21,000 jobs, get our construction sector working, working in higher education, infrastructure, clean water, and leave something for future generations. It's a good bill. Let's vote no on the refusal to adopt, get on to voting for this bill, and creating jobs in the state of Minnesota. The clerk will take the roll on the refusal to adopt.
the clerk will close the roll. There being 52 ayes and 78 nays, the motion does not prevail. We are back on the motion of adoption of the conference committee report. All those in favor of adoption, please say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Aye. The motion prevails. The report is adopted, and the clerk will give the bill its third reading as amended by conference. Third reading, House File 2700 as amended by conference. Third reading. Any further discussion? Representative Seifert. Madam Speaker, members, I would urge a no vote on passage of this bill. It is very clear to everyone in the room and the people of Minnesota that the governor is going to veto this bill in its entirety, as he should. Now, the minority leader offered uh, an open hand to take this thing back to conference committee, and he rejected that. So we are now faced with the situation where the bill will get vetoed, rightfully, and then I suppose you will try to come back and override on this pork-filled bonding bill, and then you won't be successful with that either. What are we really accomplishing, members? The people of Minnesota want us to balance the books. They want us to create an opportunity society for jobs to be created in the private sector. Yet all that you have been doing here recently is spending money we don't have to buy things that we don't need. Sculpture gardens in Minneapolis. Is there anyone hearing a demand for sculpture gardens in Minneapolis? We have enhanced snowboarding and snow tubing facilities. We've got sports facilities and civic centers and all sorts of other earmarks and pork projects that the average folks back home are simply fed up with. They are fed up with the spending. They're fed up with the borrowing. You are borrowing over a billion dollars. When you put the interest payments in this thing, it'll be up over $1.4 billion. By the time you pay for the bonds, you pay for the interest, and you end up selling the bonds. Yet it seems that the majority in this body do not understand the average person out there does not go out and max out their credit cards and then apply for another credit card when they can barely afford to put food on the table. And if you take a look at our ability to pay for the debt service, when I chaired state government finance, one of the fastest portions of this state budget is debt service. Debt service and human services are the two fastest growing parts of the budget. And we had a nice budget reserve, by the way, when we uh, switched majorities. We have zero dollars in the budget reserve right now. If you go out to the parking ramp and find 37 cents underneath your floor mat, you have more money in your budget reserve than the state of Minnesota does. That's a reality. And so what you're doing is you're trying to tax and spend and borrow and regulate this economy, thinking you're doing it better when you're doing it worse. This does not create jobs. It sucks money out of the private sector. It is full of wasteful projects, and I'm ecstatic that the governor is actually going to be the adult in this building and veto the entire bill. Vote no. Representative Emmer? Okay. Representative Liebling? Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. You know, Madam Speaker, many, many times in this body, I've heard members talk about what the governor's going to do. Oh, don't vote for this bill. The governor's going to veto it. Well, Madam Speaker, I'm not rising to a point of order today, but I do want to point out to the body that in Mason's section 112, it says, it is unparliamentary and inconsistent with the independence of a legislative body to refer to the name or office of the executive in order to influence the vote. Now, as I say, Madam Speaker, I'm not rising to point of order. We all know that this happens all the time. But Madam Speaker, we are an independent body here, and we're supposed to make our own decision. And I am tired of the governor acting like a dictator. I am tired of receiving threatening letters on my desk from this governor who doesn't seem to understand 
that we have three branches of government, that we have two independent bodies, a House and a Senate, and that we need to make an independent judgment and represent our constituents independent of him. Now, if he wants to come and negotiate, that's fine. We have a process for that. It's called a conference committee. But I'm tired of this governor complaining, as he does in this letter, about things being done out of the public's eye when this is the very way he operates, is to pull people into the back room and try to coerce them into doing the things that he wants. And I'm tired of that, members, and I hope that we don't hear any more that we should do this or that because the governor is demanding it. And I hope that none of you think that your job is to do what the governor wants you to do because I don't think your constituents would agree with that, members. The member from Stearns, Representative Gottwald. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker and members, well, I'd just be happy if somebody would reach across the aisle and ask us what we think and what we want to do, regardless of what some executive might say, Representative Liebling. Uh, that would be really helpful to the process, frankly, and we have not seen nearly enough of it in the last few years, let alone through this process. Madam Speaker and members, I want to take issue with the number that has been tossed out over and over and over again about this bill. We talk about jobs, 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 number one priority. Balancing the budget, number one priority. You can't have two number one priorities, so take your pick. But to say that this bill creates 21,000 jobs, members, documents were handed out on the House floor. I'm not going to hold them up. We're not supposed to use props. Uh, they were signed by Representative Downey. These are done by an economist. They show that the net gain is a loss of jobs, Representative Sertich and others. And the fuzzy math contained in these numbers does not add up to 21,000 jobs. It does not account for the dynamics of what is known as opportunity cost in economics. Those of you who have done economics know that there is a thing called opportunity cost. When you spend money somewhere over here, you can't spend it over here. When you spend it on government and government spending and government programs, for all of the temporary jobs, for all of the less than full-time jobs, it's going to prop up. You take it away from the private sector where it creates sustainable jobs and sustainable wealth. It's called opportunity cost. We don't account for that in 21,000. It sounds like a great number, but it's not real, members. We don't create economic recovery by building debt. Minnesotans know that from their personal lives. They've watched it happen across the country. They don't want to see it happening here. I could read you the emails I've received from so many people saying it's too much. It's too much debt. Why are you doing this? I need a job. I'm having a hard time putting bread on the table. Why are you doing this? So don't toss around these grandiose figures of 21,000 jobs and try to convince Minnesotans it's going to be a jobs bill. Because it's a trade-off, members. We're taking it from one sector, the sector we need for economic recovery, and giving it to another. Seeing no further discussion, okay, Representative Coles was up, just for the record, Representative Coles was up and he waved me off. So if someone else would like to speak, happy to take their speech next. Representative Driskowski, would you like to speak? Representative Driskowski. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker and members, uh, this is a debt creation bill. Um, we have a bill before us that is supposed to, according to its proponents, create jobs. Well, recently the federal government spent, what is it, close to a trillion dollars on a stimulus bill. And I passed around last week an article that was put together by the Associated Press. They, along with five different university economists throughout the country, followed $20 billion of stimulus money through the pipeline to learn how many unemployed people became employed because of it. 
Twenty billion dollars. Zero people became employed because of the deployment or redeployment of $20 billion of taxpayer money through that stimulus bill. This is nothing but a debt creation bill. While families are trying to pay their bills in their house, we're buying more property for WMAs. I hope Minnesotans are watching what's going on here. We're paying $4.5 million for a scientific and natural area acquisition and development. While well, families are trying to pay their insurance bill. While well, we're going to spend another $3 million for state forest land rest restoration, we're going to plant trees. While well, Minnesotans are trying to make their car payments. We're going to build a bunch of, bunch of more state trails, another $21 million. I hope Minnesotans are watching. $21 million, 25 to 30 more state trails, bike trails, while Minnesotans are unemployed. It goes on and on. I, my highlighter ran out of ink. We got another million dollars for Lake Superior campground expansion. We're going to build a campground. We're going to build a state campground, apparently a state campground, while Minnesotans can't pay their medical bills. We're going to put another $6 million into asset preservation at the zoo. We're in a $1.2 billion deficit with another $5.4 billion on the horizon. We should be looking at selling the zoo. We got amateur sports commission dollars. While families are trying to buy clothes and shoes for their kids, we're spending $950,000 of their money for a woman's hockey center in Blaine. We're spending another $4 million for the National Volleyball Center in Rochester. We're building volleyball courts while Minnesotans are going unemployed. Another $3.5 million for the Northwest Regional Sports Center in Moorhead. A sports center while families are trying to pay their bills. $2.5 million into Greater Minnesota Transit. In Greater Minnesota, we get in the car and drive. North Star Commuter Rail Extension. Another $1 million dollars to, uh, as I understand, subsidize or build more onto another train that we're already paying 80 percent of the operating costs on. Minnesotans, get out your wallets because they're taking more. A Dakota Rail Regional Trail Pedestrian and Bicycle Tunnel. We're going to build a tunnel for bicycles while Minnesotans are figuring out how to put gas in their car. The Minnesota Sculpture Garden, $2 million. Phelan Keller Regional Park, $1 million. Theodore Worth Park Winter Recreation Area, another $1 million. I hope Minnesota's watching tonight. The Chatfield Potter Center for the Arts, $5 million for the Potter Center for the Arts, while Minnesotans are scrambling to get their, get their finances in order. Duluth Zoo, $200,000. Hennepin County, Minnesota African American, uh, Madam, Madam Speaker, I, I can't hear myself talk, Madam Speaker. That's great, David, this <laughs>
Well, Representative Draskowski, it seems to me that everyone is listening to you talk because Representative David jumped out of his chair when you mentioned his project. But Representative Draskowski, oh, well. we'll continue and we'll make sure that everyone is listening closely as are Minnesotans. Uh. Representative Draskowski. Madam Speaker, this is not a partisan attack. This is a bipartisan attack on pork. I can't, I've got so much highlighter on my paper, Madam Speaker, I can't see where I am, but I'm, I'm, I need a different color. Thank you. Minneapolis Orchestra Hall, $16 million for music. While Minnesotans can't even pay for their violin lessons or their piano lessons for their kids. Rochester Mayo Civic Center Complex, $32 million. St. Cloud Civic Center Expansion, $15 million. Incidentally, I understand that these delegations from these cities are coming here to buy us lunch. Hmm. Uh, the St. Paul Asian Pacific Culture Center, $5 million for a culture center. St. Paul Ardway Center for Performing Arts, $16 million for more arts. Um, Madam Speaker and members, I thought we had an arts and crafts bill, uh, a 3 a amendment that's leveraging $280 million a year, of which 15 or so percent is supposed to be dedicated to the arts. I wonder why we're bonding for more arts. Isn't it going in the right place? Madam Speaker and members, I didn't even get all the way through my list. I hope Minnesotans are watching and watching what we are doing while they are trying to make their budgets work. We certainly are not doing our job that Representative Liebling and others, the folks in my district do understand. And I think the folks in many of our districts understand. We need to do the job and balance our budget. I have yet to see a proposal for how we're going to balance our budget in this state. Instead, we're borrowing on the credit card, raising the credit card debt, and spending, 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 while Minnesotans are wondering what's going on. I urge you to support no for this bill. The member from Scott, Representative Biskins. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Um, I uh, listened to the member from Rochester talk about how she was sick and tired. Sick and tired of the governor standing up for the taxpayers of the state of Minnesota. Member from Rochester talking about being sick and tired of being bullied, apparently, by the governor who is doing nothing more than looking out for the taxpayers of the state of Minnesota. If the representative from Rochester wants to experience being bullied, she should sit on this side of the aisle while the gags come flying at us from the speaker and the majority leader. That's being sick and tired. Members, and especially the member from Rochester, if you think you're sick and tired, you should hear what I'm hearing from the people around the state of Minnesota who are sick and tired of reckless spending and misplaced priorities, and they will express that in the not too distant future. The member from Hennepin, Representative Smith. Madam Speaker, uh, thank you. I usually don't like to get up on the floor and speak because I have <clears throat> an odd belief that when we're born our creator knows he or she knows our span of life and that our life is not necessarily measured in years and months but it's measured in words we're given a certain number of words that we're going to say while we're on earth and that when we're done saying those our time is up so I I prefer to speak as little as I can, but at the risk of shortening my life, I'm going to bring up a topic that I talked about last week, and that's public safety. Uh, another, 
One other thing I don't want to do is refer to that letter that we got from the governor because I know that seemed to bring some uh, indignant remarks. But were I to refer to that letter, I would suggest that it does contain some of the reasons that are going to cause me to vote no. Specifically, uh, it references deletion of the uh, housing of criminal sexual uh, predators at uh, Moose Lake. And as I recall, Representative Hausman, uh, on your own motion, uh, there was an amendment offered on the floor that in fact added uh, spending at Moose Lake for the sexual uh, uh, criminals uh, to the tune of $90 million. And that, that passed the floor 114 votes to 19. That was a very clear statement from the House, and yet I see that that was dropped in conference. Uh, many reasons why we'll be voting no, but that certainly is the primary one. I noticed that letter, again, I'm not going to refer to it, but that it, it says that while we're not spending on the uh, Moose Lake uh, sexual predator, $90 million, we are uh, on some other priorities, and they've been mentioned, the Minneapolis Sculpture Garden, snowboarding, snow tubing, sports facilities. Uh, Representative Hausman, when you immediately referenced the snowboarding and, and snow tubing, you did take that on. I kind of admired you taking that on right out of the chute. But you referred to Olympics, uh, people trying out for the Olympics, maybe using those facilities. And then you started talking about ski wax being made in Minnesota. I, I lost track of that. But I, I did happen to, to feel that perhaps uh, we've dropped in this bonding bill spending on putting sexual criminals where they belong, and that's away from our constituents, and instead are spending a little too much on bread and circuses. And I, in fact, had to look up that phrase because I had forgotten what it meant. And according to uh, the source I found, uh, bread and circuses is a metaphor for handouts and petty amusements that politicians use to gain popular support instead of getting support through sound public policy. I guess I would just ask this question. Do you think that our population and our constituents are so concerned and so defined by entertainment and instant self-gratification and personal pleasures that they no longer value civic virtue and that they no longer value the public safety of themselves and their children? Well, my constituents pay taxes, and they do it so that this government keeps them safe. And then when we have bad people, they need to be put away and kept away from us and our children. This is no longer in the bill, does not deserve my support. The member from Hennepin, Representative Zellers. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. And uh, we had a chance here earlier tonight to, to go back to reload, re reboot, reset the process, do the work that uh, should have been done in committee. We pass that opportunity up, so we're, here we are. We're going to vote for the bill. Uh, we can beg as, as hard as we want that this is a jobs bill, and we can throw a number around of how many jobs it's going to create, but the proof will be in the pudding. And members, quite honestly, if you'd like jobs to come back to the state of Minnesota, free the private sector. Don't pass onerous rules and regulations like cap and tax. Don't add on five new mandates that have been introduced, as Representative Abler told me, into the health care system this year. Don't throw that pandemic of uncertainty into the private sector that makes them sit back and say, I'm not sure what my government's going to do to me other than take my money and spend it, whether it's the middle of the night, whether it's Sunday afternoon as we're at home with our families, you're spending a billion dollars that we don't have. There is an opportunity here, members, to do the right thing, to be frugal, spend the tax dollars just as those families around Minnesota spend theirs. You pinch every penny. You don't spend when you have to. You save when you can, not when you have to. You look at your budget just as families across Minnesota look at their budget. You don't have the money. You don't spend it. The fact that you're going to spend a billion dollars here tonight before you've offered a plan to fix the $1.2 billion budget deficit will not be lost on the voters of the state of Minnesota. They're out there, they're watching, they're listening. You don't want to listen to the governor? We 
be very curious as we hear, as we go through the session, how many times his name will be brought up in less than favorable light once we get to the budget process. But we'll make sure that Representative Liebling is held, uh, we'll, we'll hold our word and we'll make sure that she's held to her word on that as well. But the fact that we're spending here, Madam Speaker, and members, before we balance the budget won't be lost on the voters of the state of Minnesota. Beg all you want, push whatever number you'd like, the, the taxpayers of the state, the people paying the bill for what we're going to vote on here tonight, know exactly what this is. We're borrowing money against our children's future to pay for projects today. Some well-intentioned, some very, very good projects. Taking care of public safety when it comes to floods in the Red River Valley or in Lanesboro. Locking up violent sex offenders, as my colleague Representative Smith said, I think is one of the core functions of government. So I worked with him on a bill and Representative Hillstrom to lock up violent sex offenders for life. If we're going to lock them up, we've got to have the facilities. This bill leaves those priorities behind. Compliment Representative Howells and the work he's done on this bill. He tried to make a, a bill a little bit better. Unfortunately, we're going to be left with the consequence that far too many folks in the, out in the real world looked at and said it was going to happen anyway. It was going to be vetoed. That's where we were going. Sad that we're living up to that here tonight. We had a chance again tonight to go back to conference committee, try to amend the bill up, get some compromise, but no, it's your way or the highway. We've seen this act before. Madam Speaker, members vote no. The clerk will take the roll on the bill. The clerk will close the roll. There being 85 ayes and 46 nays, the bill is repassed as amended by the conference and its title agreed to. Announcements, announcements. Announcements, members. Representative Sertich. Madam Speaker, I move in the House adjourned today to adjourn until 10.30 a.m. Thursday, February 25th, 2010. Representative Sertich moves that when the House adjourns, adjourns until 10.30 a.m. Thursday, February 25th, 2010. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Opposed, no. The motion prevails. Representative Sertich. I move the House do now adjourn. Representative Sertich moves the House do now adjourn. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. The motion prevails and the House stands adjourned until 10.30 a.m. Thursday, February 